I see my presentation is not scaled correctly, but I mostly have images, so I don't think there's going to be any, any text that overlaps. Um, after watching the first two talks, I, I sort of wondered whether or not I should have renamed my presentation to say, using encryption to try to protect sources and secrets. It is, it is well known that encryption can help with a lot of things, but if you have a backdoor, if you have a firmware implant, it's not really going to matter if someone is exfilling your data at that point before you encrypt it. Anyways, um, I am a security researcher. I have a background in pen testing and code audits. Um, I am sometimes a technical advisor. I'm on the technical advisory board for Freedom of the Press Foundation, which I'll talk a bit about later, and also the TrueCrypt Audit Project. And I'm also on the re review board for Black Hat um, Europe. I'm sometimes a journalist. I write for Forbes every now and then. I haven't written anything in probably six months, um, but I have some interesting documents that I ob obtained via the Freedom of Information Act that I hope to write about soon. Um, so last year, and uh, thank you to Kaspersky for, for inviting me back, last year I spoke about this website where you can buy any drug that you want anonymously using Bitcoin. It's called Silk Road. I'm sure many of you have heard about the site. Uh, it, was, it was taken down by um, the FBI and a couple of other three-letter agencies after running for about two and a half years. Um, and this site actually does have something in common with this site. So this site is using the piece of software that I'm going to talk about later where it allows media organizations to accept documents from anonymous sources. So now what does this website where you can buy and sell drugs have to do with this website where you can anonymously leak documents? Well, the common denominator between the two is Tor. And I'm sure all of you, most of you, have heard about Tor and the Tor project. I was a contractor for the Tor project for about four years, doing anything from security research to support and training of journalists. But in this specific case with, with these two sites, Tor has a component that's called Tor Hidden Services, which allows anyone to set up a website that means unless you have physical access to the hardware or you hack the site or the site is set up incorrectly, you don't know where it is hosted, you don't know who's visiting the website because they're all using Tor. So that was the case for Silk Road, and it is the case for all the sites that have set up that are using SecureDrop, is that you have to use Tor to access the sites, um, and you, that goes for both the source wanting to leak information and also for the journalists wanting to download information. And in the case of SecureDrop, the hidden service is mostly there to protect the sources, not so much to protect the location of the servers. Um, as I'll talk a bit about later, we do recommend physical hardware hosted within the newsrooms um, for these deployments. So I just want to take a, take a step back. Uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation is the uh, nonprofit organization that is currently developing and maintaining and helping uh, organizations install SecureDrop. It's a relatively new organization with um, four people that also, in addition to working on SecureDrop, helps raise funds for other non, uh, non-profit or open source projects, such as Tor, um, Tails, that some of you may have heard of. Um, and the plan is that Freedom of the Press Foundation will also go out and actually train journalists and help them use not just SecureDrop, but also other um, digital security tools. So if you look on the uh, Freedom of the Press website and if you read about SecureDrop, you will see that it is mentioned as a open source whistleblower submission system. Um, and all the documentation and everything that you see on the SecureDrop pages will be very, very targeted towards a source and a journalist, but there's nothing to say that you can't use the system for just the general purpose of uh, sharing information securely in some way or another. You don't necessarily have to be a journalist to use the system. So in December last year, I, I sat down and I wrote this threat model document about SecureDrop. And 
I don't know if you can read what it, what it says on the screen, but it says assumptions about the source. And while SecureDrop tries to, tries to help sources securely send information to, to journalists, it can't necessarily protect the source if the source does something wrong on his or her end before transferring the information. So in using the SecureDrop system, we do assume that the source has an authentic version of the Tor browser, does not have any firmware implants, backdoors, keyloggers, anything like that, has actually found the legit hidden service that he or she wants to use when sending this information, and so on and so on and so on. So SecureDrop tries to solve this one very specific problem, but the, there's still the challenge of how do you teach potential sources how to do digital security, how do you teach journalists to do the same, and how do you teach journalists to actually work with highly sensitive documents um, if that is not something that they have done previously. So right now, there are about 15 media organizations, uh, mostly in the US, but also a couple in Europe that are using SecureDrop. Um, this list is on the Freedom of the Press website, where the idea is you can go, you can look at the list. The landing page, the blue links in the middle, um, are the websites or the pages that the media organizations have set up specifically to inform sources that, hey, we have this thing, it's called Secure Up, here's how you use it to send us information. Um, and then you got the dot onion links on the side. So you don't have to tell Freedom of the Press Foundation that you've set up a secure website unless you want to. Um, so there are 15 that we know about right now. I know there are two other ones, more unofficial ones, in Denmark, and I'm sure there's a couple of other ones floating around as well. So I figured I would go through the sort of what the, what the workflow looks like from the source side and then from the journalist side and then uh, finish off by looking at, at the workflow combined. So for the source, so the source would, would first off start with, you know, I have documents that I want to send. Who do I want to send it to? Let's say you want to share it with The Intercept. So you would find The Intercept's landing page for SecureDrop where they have posted information about their site, about the type of um, information that they're after maybe, who would be working with the documents. Um, it's, it's very much up to the media organization to put whatever they want on this page. Um, and it also has the dot onion address. So if you visit the dot onion address, you get a page that looks sort of like this. Um, and if you click on submit documents, you get a page that looks like this where you're given a code name. It is a minimum seven words, maximum is 10. Um, and here's like another, another challenge with SecureDrop is that we give you a seven word code name and we tell you to store it somewhere safe. If you write this down on a piece of paper that is later found when you know, your, your boss checks your desk or some three-letter agency comes to visit you, then you're not really that anonymous and it can easily be, be found out that you were the one that used secured up to send these documents. Um, anyways, you get this code name, you click continue, and you get this page where you can choose to either upload documents or you can send a message. If you want to, you can encrypt the documents to a journalist's public key uh, before sending it or uploading it, um, but that's completely up to the source on whether or not this is something that the source wants to do. Um, and once that's done, that's, that's pretty much it for the source. The source can use the code name to check back later for replies from the journalist, um, but you don't necessarily have to do that, and so once you submit a message or upload a file, that's, that's pretty much it. So on the journalist side, the, I mentioned that the journalists will also use uh, a Tor hidden service to connect. Now, the journalist will use Tor to connect to a different hidden service than the one the sources connect to, even though they are technically hosted on the same physical server. So the journalist will, will pull up a page like this um, the document interface that it's called is an authenticated Tor hidden service. So it means that not only do you need to know the .onion URL, you need to put something in your Tor configuration file that tells Tor that you are allowed to connect to the site. If you don't have that token in your configuration file, 
um, the Tor browser just won't let you connect at all. In addition to that, you also need to have a username, a password, and a two-factor authentication token, uh, hopefully a stronger password than what you see in the screenshots. Um, two-factor authentication tokens can be either a Google Authenticator or a YubiKey, which was recently implemented. So anyways, journalist logs in, and if there's any documents, they'll be, they'll, they'll be listed um, similar to what you see here. Each, each source is given a two-word code name to make it a bit easier on the journalists to work with. The code names are not the same as uh, whatever the source gets. Um, but if the source logs in with the same code name and submits something else, it will pop up under the same, um, under the same name um, in the document interface. So from here, you can see whether or not you have any messages. The gray boxes all the way on the right will say how long ago you got something new from this specific source. Um, you can click, if you click on one of the uh, sources, you will get the list of the documents or the replies or messages that have been submitted. And at this point, you can also communicate with the source by typing in a reply so that if the source does log in again later, the source will see the messages at the bottom of the screen and you can communicate that way. Now, so I wanted to take some time to, to, to talk about the workflow um, because what I've covered so far is, is pretty high level. So all the way up on the left, you see the source who's got some documents that uh, he or she wants to share and the person's computer, which is at the very least running the Tor browser, maybe using Tails. Um, if you're not familiar with Tails, it is a um, live Debian or live Linux system running off of a USB stick where everything that you do is automatically sent through the Tor network. And everything that you do within that session once you boot is just stored in memory. So when you pull out the USB stick or when you shut off your computer, um, the memory is wiped. So in terms of traces left on your computer that you use Tails, um, there aren't a whole lot. There may be something in memory or on the actual USB stick that you have, um, but far less traces than if you used the Tor browser, for example. So the source would then find the dot onion address for the secure website that uh, whatever media organization they have decided to send this information to has set up and connect to the site using Tor and, and send the documents. Now the metal gray box that says secure drop and the application server and the monitor server. So those two servers are physical servers hosted in the, in the, in the newsroom um, generally, there are, there, are, there are some cases where the organizations have decided to host them somewhere else, but it's always physical hardware in control of the journalists that are working with the system. Um, you have the application server, which is running three Tor hidden services, one for the source interface, one for the document interface, and one for SSH, so that the IT admin can connect uh, and do some operations if need be. The monitor server is just using, um, it runs another Tor hidden service and it runs SSH that allows the admin to just check that the application server is actually still up and running and it uses OSEC and it will send you daily encrypted emails about it. So let's say that the journalist has uh, started up Tails on his or her computer and has logged into this document interface and seen that there's documents in the list. At this point, those documents are all encrypted. They're encrypted the second they're uh, saved on the application server. So the journalist has to start up Tails on a different computer, on a completely air-gapped computer. It doesn't have any Wi-Fi. It's never been connected to the internet. It doesn't have a hard drive. It just sits there for this purpose of viewing documents from SecureDrop. So the journalist will put the documents on a USB stick, go over to the secure viewing station, which is this air-gapped machine, and then look at the documents there. And if there's any communication that needs to be done with the source, the journalist has to go back to his or her normal computer with Tor, log in, send a reply, download a reply, go all the way back to the secure viewing station and view the documents there. 
Um, it is a bit of a complicated process, but it does mean that if anyone were to send something that tried to connect uh, to a different site or call home or um, drop any type of malware, the secure viewing station with tails would at least help mitigate that very specific threat. Um, and once they have documents, they can continue working on them either on that machine or take the bits and pieces that they need over to their normal laptop, work on them, and eventually publish articles with them. So I have two minutes and 55 seconds left. Um, and that was pretty much what I wanted to, to, to show you about the secure job system. Moving forward, there's a lot of discussion within Freedom of the Press Foundation and in sort of the tech community in general about how do we better educate sources. There's a big challenge where people who talk to journalists don't often consider themselves sources at all, ever. Um, there's another challenge of how do you train journalists, how do you teach them to use these tools securely. Anyone who's been a security consultant knows that it's a bit of a challenge to convince a firm that they need an audit or uh, a pen test or that they need a retest so that uh, you can make sure that they actually fix the issues you found last time or that they need training in how to write secure code. The same things definitely do apply for media organizations, convincing someone that it is really, really worth it for you to sit down and take a couple of hours to learn how to use these tools and continue having this training on a regular basis. Um, and I figured I would, I would stop there. Um, I have just under two minutes left, so if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. For one ah, yes. Runa Sandwick, we have, we have time for one question, if there's an urgent question. Oh, that's, that looked urgent, sir. Now, my question would be from the press, has anybody heard of you know, any law enforcement or anybody trying to go after those secure servers in the newsroom you know, with subpoenas or just, oops, they disappeared? <laughs> so the first secure drop site was set up about a year and a half ago, and as far as I know, there has been zero legal issues involved. Okay, if we have a very short one, we can do, and otherwise we'll go to the tequila. Yeah, one question. Yeah, just, just one question. So I'm a journalist. I've been working with sources in the past, and usually I've met those sources. So sometimes it's really important to know what the motive of the source is, just to figure out if we are not being tricked into something. So I, I think the system is terrific, but how do you see that problem that you actually don't know if the source is legit on the other side? Sorry, I didn't hear the second half of your question. Can you... Say it again. Um, in 10 seconds, please. <laughs> okay. How do you make sure that the, the source is uh, legit, that's actually a real source? So I'm a journalist, so I've met with sources in the past, and sometimes it's, it's uh, important to know what the motive of the source is mm -hmm. in order not uh, being played as a journalist. Or... Yeah, so this, this sort of comes back to the challenge that, that any journalist has when working with anonymous sources. How do you verify the documents that you get? Um, in some cases, journalists do have other sources that can look at the documents and, and potentially verify them. In some cases, it is less about the source wanting to be completely anonymous forever and just more about the source wanting to send off the documents and make sure that it gets published before... Uh, the source decides to either go public or doesn't at that point really care about what happens next. Um, but I'm not sure exactly how media organizations or how journalists are treating the documents that they receive from completely anonymous sources. But I, I, yeah, I'd say it's a challenge. Okay, I have to stop you here. Go talk to her afterwards. That was Runa Sentvik, ladies and gentlemen.